Um, so I'd just like to welcome you all to Bristol Data Week. This session uh, is a part of our interactive program of speakers, training and workshops showcasing the latest in data science and AI. Um, just a few kind of housekeeping points before we get started. Please do note that this session is being recorded. Um, and with that in mind, please do make sure that you've read through the Gene Golding Institute Code of Conduct, which was shared in uh, the holding slide and we'll also share again uh, in the Zoom chat for you to take a look at as well. Um, in uh, to be uh, to be careful for the speaker, please, and everybody else, please do make sure that you mute your microphone um, unless you're um, asked to unmute by the presenter or speaker. Um, and then just for us, please do complete the registration and feedback forms that we'll be sharing with you um, in uh, the chat uh, throughout the meeting as well. This will really help us to see how we're doing and how we can make these uh, sessions better and, and to continue providing such training sessions in future. Um, and finally, do please introduce yourself in the chat box. Let us know who you are, where you've come from, um, and why you're interested in attending this session of Bristol Data Week. Um, so I'd just like to briefly introduce the Gene Golding Institute, which is supporting and hosting Bristol Data Week this week. Uh, the Gene Golding Institute is the University of Bristol's Research Institute for Data Science and Data Intensive Research. We work to connect multidisciplinary experts across the University of Bristol and indeed beyond. Um, and we support this through our cross-cutting activities, including organizing and supporting events, training, providing funding opportunities. And of course, we also, um, we also are the University of Bristol's uh, main hub and point of contact to the Alan Turing Institute, the UK National Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Um, so as I say, this session is coming to you as a part of our Bristol Data Week program. Um, I share with you here a kind of snapshot of what the program for the week looks like. So as you can see, we've got lots of events going on from seminars, training events and workshops um, to social events as well. Um, so there is still time to register for events later in the week. So please do go to our website and take a look to see if there are any other events that might be of interest to you. This week wouldn't be possible without all of our partners, sponsors and um, speakers who we have attending and providing sessions for this week. So just to flash this slide to, to show our, our thanks and gratitude to all of our partners and collaborators uh, today. I'm not going to go through the full schedule of Data Week because we've got so much going on. However, there is one event that we're really excited um, to share with people, um, which is that the Gene Golding Institute is supporting a um, AI film prize in association with the Bristol Science Film Festival. So this Friday uh, at three o'clock at the Watershed in Bristol, there will be free screenings of the winning films from this selection, and there'll be a chance to have a Q&A with the creators of those films. Uh, the winner will be announced live at that event. So if you're in Bristol and fancy uh, watching some cool short films on a Friday afternoon, then do check this out and come on down. So in just a moment, I'll be handing over to our speaker for today. I just wanted to say, please do connect with us and keep in touch. Let us know how you're finding the week. Um, you can connect with us on Twitter or by subscribing to our newsletter to keep up to date with all of our upcoming um, events. So I will stop sharing my screen there. I'm gonna hand us over now to Luke, who is going to take us through this session on the introduction to Tableau. Luke, over to you. There we go, I was on mute. Classic lockdown uh, thing. Um, could I, someone confirm that you can hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly, thanks Luke. Uh, Perfect. All right, let me just share my screen. Okay, before we start, um, this will be quite a hands on session. So um, you'll need to have Tableau Public downloaded. Tableau Public is the free version of Tableau. Um, I will tell you how you can get the, the paid version for free a little bit later. Um, 
but I'm going to put a link into the chat here. If you haven't downloaded Tableau Public prior to this session, please could you do that? I've got a few slides uh, to start with, so it'll give you a bit of time to download that. There is the link to the download. Um, the second thing I'm going to post into the chat is a Google Drive link as well. So actually, I'll post the short, short link into there as well. If while I'm talking, you could click on, on that second link and that will take you to this uh, Google Drive file share. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here. If you're coming to the session tomorrow, then we'll use a bit more of this as well. So um, none of this stuff is, uh, I, I'm not precious about any of it. There's a, quite a lot of information, data sets and stuff like that in here. It stays up there permanently. Um, once you have the link, you can access it. You can download all of it if you want to share it. I, don't, I really don't care. Um, it's, it's quite useful for, uh, for learning various bits of Tableau. But what I want you to do initially is go to the data folder. And there's a file in here uh, called sample EU Superstore. And that's the, the third file from the bottom. If you could all download that spreadsheet and just save it somewhere on your desktop or in your downloads folder. That would uh, save us a little bit of time later on. Okay, I'm gonna monitor the chat. Um, if you do have any questions, it would be great if you could just shout them out. Um, I find it quite distracting sometimes if I went to look at look at the chat and watching questions come down. So feel free to, uh, to interrupt me if there's something you want to ask, I really don't mind. Uh, if, if any of you want to, put your cameras on as well. Uh, that's always nice. I'm not just talking to the screen, but completely up to you. Um, okay, here we go, let's get started. So I've got a few slides to, to go through. First of all, welcome to the session. Um, and I must extend my apologies to anyone who is um, coming tomorrow. Um, I was gonna repeat this session, but in person in Bristol tomorrow. Um, and there's also a kind of intermediate session um, shortly after tomorrow's session, but my, my wife has um, unfortunately been diagnosed with COVID. So um, I'm, I'm okay, but I thought it was probably prudent not to come down and risk uh, passing it on to everyone, especially after the, the two years that we've had. So, um, so you've got me virtually. My name is Luke. I work for a company called The Information Lab, and we are the largest data visualization consultancy in Europe. Um, we specialize in, in two softwares, uh, Tableau, which is what we're going to look at today, and Alteryx, which is a um, data, data manipulation um, software. It's really good for restructuring data, cleansing data, joining data together, and, and all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, but it's, it's Tableau today. Um, looking at my chat. Thanks, James. Hi, Eureka. Why are you from the Philippines? That's really cool. Um, my details are on the screen. So my I don't know if any of you are on Twitter. Um, my my Twitter um, handle, I guess you call it, is at Barnsley Beast. Uh, it's a long story and it's kind of predates my involvement in, in data, but um, that's me. Um, and the Information Labs Twitter is at InfoLab UK, and the Data School, which I'll talk about, is at Data School UK as well. And um, if any of you fancy tweeting about the session, if you're enjoying it, that um, always uh, always goes down well. Okay. What we're going to look at today is and talk, we're going to talk a little bit about what data visualization is, why we why we might want to do it, um, some things to to look out for, some things to avoid, um, and we're going to spend most of the time uh, building a dashboard together. And it's my intention for this session that by the end of it, you're going to be able to connect to data in Tableau. You're going to be able to um, build some charts and build a basic dashboard and make it interactive. Um, that's probably all we can hope to do um, within an, an hour and 40 or so. Um, and if you're around tomorrow, we'll, we'll go into a, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more detail around that. We're going to be using Tableau Public today, uh, which I, I mentioned. That's the free version of Tableau. Uh, there is a fully paid version of Tableau, which uh, costs businesses about a thousand pounds per person per year. 
Um, if you're in uh, full-time education or if you're an academic, you get access to that for free through their academic program. So it's a really good, um, really good deal, really, if you're involved in education. Um, the interface is, is pretty much the same though between the free version and the fully paid one. Um, so yeah, today we'll, we'll use Tableau Public. I've mentioned that that link already. Um, so just a brief introduction to, to who we are, the Information Lab. Um, we've been going around 12 years. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a data visualization, data analytics consultancy, um, pretty much the largest one in Europe now, specializing only in, in data analytics. Um, Tableau and Alteryx are the main two tools that we use. We also partner with AWS and Snowflake, which is a cloud database company as well. Um, we've we're in six uh, European countries. Um, we have a core team of consultants um, of about 30 people. Um, my role is, is global head of recruitment for, for the data school, which I'll talk about shortly, which is kind of like our trainee consulting program. Um, but I, prior to doing this role, I was a consultant in our core team for four years and the, the business has expanded and a few of us have been able to try our hands at, at different things. And our core team does, does short-term, quite agile consulting couple of days here, a couple of days there with different companies. In the data school, we started about seven years ago. Um, we were quite passionate about data literacy as well as obviously being a, a company that um, wants to make money. Um, we, we do care a lot about data literacy and we wanted to create a program which would kind of launch people onto a career in, in analytics. Um, and it's been really successful so far. This slide's actually a little bit out of date. We now recruit 72 people a year in London. So nine months of the year um, we recruit and that's cohorts of eight people. Um, it's a two and a half year contract. Um, the first four months is, is purely training, it's fully paid right from day one. Um, after the four months of training, you do four six month placements as a consultant uh, with some of our clients. And we've had about 250 people go through the program and uh, we've started in in sydney um about three or four years ago and recently in melbourne hamburg and actually at the beginning of the month uh, in new york as well which is pretty cool we have some tableau visionaries within the company these used to be called zen masters they're kind of people who are recognized by the the tableau community as being um experts in the product, but also people who give back a lot in terms of uh, websites, free training, that sort of thing. And Andy Kriebel, um, top left there, he, he runs our, he's our global head coach of the data school. And he was uh, previously running the Facebook Tableau Center of Excellence um, in America before joining us. And um, Facebook are one of the largest users of Tableau in the world. We also have some visionaries from the data school as well. So it's kind of, proof that um that the program works and we're producing really good people um, i won't go into too many details about them but you can rest assured that they're all um they're all great i get asked quite a lot don't i need to be a, a geek or a programmer or an it person to, to do all of this stuff and by all means it backgrounds are, are great um but the answer is no this is my favorite slide by the way and I'm quite a good example of this. I, I went to Southampton University uh, quite a long time ago. You can tell that by the old logo for the university. And I did a BA in Spanish, um, didn't know what I wanted to do afterwards. So I stayed on and did a, a master's in international relations. Uh, then September the 11th happened, all of the graduate schemes um, closed their doors. And I found myself temping in a bank doing Excel stuff and making tea and coffee. And that kind of just progressed through to, to what I'm doing now, really. I've worked in analytical roles since. Um, but you absolutely don't need a, a really uh, IT techie background um, to be a good consultant. In fact, you know, people skills, uh, creativity, analytical skills are, are, are super important. For some of our consultants, we're completely agnostic to people's backgrounds. We, within this group of people, this is only a small snapshot of them. Uh, we have a medical doctor. Um, a Shakespearean actor, a nurse, a librarian, a dentist, um, some people with PhDs, some people who didn't go to university. So there's a real, a real mix in there and they've all been great in their own ways. So I'm assuming as this talk is part of the, the Gene Golding Institute and Data Week, you probably all know what, what data is. Um, so sorry if I'm teaching you to, to suck eggs, but um, 
probably worth talking about about a little bit. So a, a good um, definition for data is facts and stats collected together for reference or analysis. And as we probably all know, data is is everywhere these days. It's a really important skill to have to be able to analyze data. Um, and data is being generated at an exponential rate by by companies. This guy is uh, W. Edwards Deming. He was a US uh, engineer who's credited actually for, um, for helping rebuild the Japanese economy after uh, World War II. Um, but he was also one of, the, one of the founders of what we know as data science today. And this is one of his, he, he's kind of a gold mine for, for quotes around data. And this is one of his most famous ones. Um, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Um, he also said, in God we trust, um, all others bring data. And this is an interesting article here. It's from the Harvard Business Review from 2003. And they did a survey of, of business executives and they found that 45% that of them were using their gut instincts to, to take decisions uh, within their businesses. And this is only you know, almost 20 years ago. It's not that long ago. And it's quite a worrying statistic that if you, if you know your business, you know your industry, um, you, you can probably guess a few times um, if you, you know, if you know it inside out. Um, but eventually, if you are using your gut instinct or, or just making judgment calls, then you might, well, you probably will get it wrong, and there'll be a financial and reputational risk for for doing that. So that's where we, we really try and use data now to back up and justify any any decisions, any assumptions, assertions that we make within within business or academia for that matter as well. But I guess the more important question would be why did 45% of corporate executives use their gut instinct rather than relying on facts and figures, as it says in the article? And the reason for that is that there's, um, well, there's a few reasons for it. So first of all, I mentioned data is being generated exponentially in terms of the, the quantity of it. And people were drowning. They didn't know where to start. And... I was for a few reasons, really. But first of all, the, the skill levels in terms of data analysis just weren't there. Um, and part of that is to do with the tools that were available. So within the business, typically, it still happens today, not so much, but it still does happen. You would have to go to the IT department and say, I've got this data, I need it reshaped, or I need some um, analysis be, you know, be done on it. And then you, you kind of take a ticket, join the queue, um, come back in two weeks and someone someone will have worked through their list of chores or jobs to do and, and finally get to yours and, and there you go. Um, also, the, the software available um, on the right-hand side, the screenshot there is from a database interface and it's not very friendly. You need some coding knowledge, so some SQL in the middle. Um, and obviously, as soon as you start relying on people with SQL knowledge to, to do your data manipulation, et cetera, you're, you're creating a bottleneck within a business and you're gonna to have to wait. So what is data visualization? Got a little quiz for you here. Um, does anyone know what film this is from, by the way? Shall we play a game? I'll, I'll... Yes, war games, well done. Most people, most people say saw um, for this one and it's not saw, but it's war games, well done. How about this one? <laughs> An extra nice one. How about this one? Easy one. Iron Man. Yeah. How about this one? Someone other than Jason. Jason's clearly a movie buff. Avatar. Yeah. Well done. How about this one? Someone must know this one. Even either this one. I've got kids though. Yes, Avengers. Well done. This is more my era now. How about top left? What have we got? Ignoring the spelling mistake of engineering, which presumably didn't get picked up in the movies. Star Trek. Yeah, well done. Top right. This is a classic. Yes, Knight Rider with the mighty David Hasselhoff. 
Um, bottom left, this film actually came out the year I was born. Gives you an indication as to how old, old and grey I am. No. Yes, Star Wars. Well done. And then bottom right is War Games. Again, I think Matthew Broderick was in that and he was a, a computer programmer or hacker who hacked into NORAD in the US where they control all the nuclear weapons and almost started a nuclear war. Um, so why am I why am I showing you this anyway? Um, I'm not showing, I'm not here to give you a movie quiz, but just trying to highlight the data visualization is everywhere. So all of these movies are showing some form of data visualization, albeit obviously not real data, um, but it's there, it's everywhere. I, I have a smart watch on my, on my wrist. I can see what my heartbeat is. I can see how many steps I've done. I can see what the weather's doing. Um, if you have a mobile phone, that's, that's visualizing data for you as well. Um, if I, you know, I live in London, if I take the tube to work, I get told how many minutes till my, my tube train arrived. Again, that's data visualization. We, we're gonna look at it all the time, but don't necessarily realize um, what, what we're looking, what it is we're looking at. Jason's written, use the force with your data. Yeah, um, good, uh, good idea. Okay. So data visualization, we can summarize, is the translation of data, the big tables of numbers into a visual format. And when we're taking something inherently complex, like a table of numbers, turning it into something easy to understand, um, visual, it means it becomes much more accessible for, for everyone. We're very visual creatures. We, we understand things in a visual format much more easily. So this allows us to see trends, correlations, outliers, and I've written errors in the data as well, much more easily. Um, it's incredible how many times when I was a consultant, I'd go to clients and connect to their data in Tableau. They take a look at what I've created and they say, oh no, that number's wrong. And actually when you dig into it, the underlying data is wrong, but you just wouldn't notice it if that number was hiding in a database table somewhere. So um, visualizing data can also be a very, a very good way of checking whether what you're doing is correct as well. And, and yeah, we, we respond much more um, quickly to, to visual things. And this guy, if you get into data visualization a bit more, Andy Kirk, he's quite prominent um, in the field. And he's saying, really, it's just a brain hack. So we're, we're bypassing our, our visual perception abilities in order to, to help understanding. And it's very, very true. And what we try and do with data visualization is leverage our memories. Might sound like a weird concept, but um, there are three types of memory that we all have as humans. Um, broadly speaking. We have our long-term memory, so I don't forget what my name is, I don't forget where I live, apart from if I've been to the pub sometimes. Um, we have our short-term memory, so that's where we remember something, and if we don't have to reuse that information, then we'll forget it. So using the tube train example from just now, if I have to wait 10 minutes for a tube train, I'll be you know, a bit, a bit annoyed about it. Um, but if you ask me in two weeks' time how long I had to wait for a tube train two weeks ago, I probably couldn't tell you because I haven't had to reuse that information, so I forget it. Um, and, but the most important type of memory that we're, we're looking to hit when we visualize data is called our, our sensory, or sometimes it's heard of as the, called the pre-attentive uh, memory. And that's where we, we kind of inherently know what it is we're looking at. So I know, I know this, is a, this is a mobile phone, I know this is a mouse, um, I know this is a keyboard, et cetera. We just know, we don't have to think about it. Um, so bearing that in mind, there are some pre-attentive or sensory attributes that we can use to help us get our message across in, in data visualization. And these include things like, um, like size, length, position, uh, enclosure, orientation, color, those sorts of things. Um, which leads me on to this. You've, you've, seen this uh, grid of numbers on the screen for a little bit. How many fives are there? Can anyone tell me? Six. Cheers, John. I think someone needs to mute their mic. Um, I'm getting some interference on here. Someone, whoever's unmuted could mute. That would be much appreciated. So with this grid of numbers, depending on how, that's great, thank you. Um, depending on how your brain works, you've either gone across row by row or down column by column and counted up 
the fives and you've used your short-term memory to remember how many fives there are in there. Um, probably took you a little time to, to, to go through and add them all up. Thanks, Eureka. Um, if we were to use or leverage your sensory memory to do this, and I'm gonna use color to do this, actually you'll get to the result much more quickly. So there you go, very simple example, but essentially this is what we're looking to do in data visualization, okay? I've now used your sensory memory to, to help you understand the problem a bit more. Data visualization has been around for quite a long time. I don't know if anyone's seen this before. If you know who, um, who created it, put it in the chat. Um, this is dealing with the, the Crimean War from the mid 1800s. If we look at the right hand, well done James, look at the right hand uh, diagram, it's called a coxcomb chart and you can create these in Tableau. They take a bit of trigonometry and stuff um, and they're not necessarily best practice, but, uh, but Florence Nightingale, um, created this uh, by hand, which is pretty cool. And she's most famous for nursing, of course, but what people don't realize, um, yes, uh, what people don't realize is that she was also a very eminent statistician and she collected data about all of the soldiers that she, um, she, she treated um, during the war. And yeah, she categorized them into different areas and the blue sections are the ones that she wanted to um, to have the most impact on and these were people who died from preventable causes and we can see some seasonality in the data so each slice of this of this chart represents a month and from the bottom going around clockwise we can see that April, May, June, July in the warmer months of the year um, there were less um, less people dying from preventable diseases and that spiked during the winter where it's cold people were dying from hypothermia uh, malnutrition um, other preventable conditions or diseases as well. And there are a few examples of, of some really old data visualizations out there. What's Tableau? Uh, it's being used pretty much everywhere. Um, now, every, every company you can think of really is, is almost certainly using Tableau in some uh, way, shape or form. Um, it's very scalable and can go from one user to full enterprise solutions. Um, no coding required, you'll see when we, uh, shortly when we get onto it, is um, it's all drag and drop, which is great. Um, you can integrate it with R and Python and SQL if you want to, um, but it wasn't really designed for that. It was designed to um, to open up the ability to analyze data to as many people as possible. And it was created at Stanford University in the US. And this is their, their strap line. Um, you can create dashboards for consumption on mobile phones, on tablets, on, um, on the computers as well. These three people invented it. Um, Pat Hanrahan in the middle uh, was the PhD supervisor of the other two at Stanford. Pat Hanrahan actually is, is kind of a big deal in visual things. And he was one of the founders behind Pixar, the digital animation studio. He actually created the coding language called Renderman, which they use in all, um, you know, or most animated, um, digitally animated movies now. Um, and he, he he's a Proud recipient of three Oscars. I believe the last one was for the skin texture of Gollum in Lord of the Rings. Um, but he also invented Tableau with, with the other two, and he's still very involved with um, the development of the product. You can do all sorts of things. These are just several examples. Um, we've got the migration of uh, uh, some sort of bird of prey, top left. We've got world golf rankings over time, bottom left, domestic violence against women at the bottom in Spain. Um, in the middle, uh, commuting times of the day on the right-hand side at the top. Um, so pretty varied things people are visualizing. I'll show you Tableau Public, uh, the website later on. Some examples, um, at the Information Lab, we, we work with about 10 Premier League football teams. They're using Tableau to, to measure player performance when they start getting tired, how far they're running, et cetera, as well as on the business side. So maybe putting stadium maps into it and, and seeing which seats are the most popular. Um, through to Facebook, who are huge users, financial institutions, consumer goods, um, websites, etc. And I put um, Barack and Donald, I could have put Hillary in there as well. And US politicians are required by law on their websites to, to, to say what they're spending their campaign money on. And both of those two um, spent money on Tableau licenses. Normally, it's kind of buried away in their 
in their website somewhere, but they all have a list of, of what they spend their funds on. Okay, that's enough of me talking. What I'd like you to do is, hopefully you all have Tableau on your computers now. And what I'd like you to do is to load it up, Tableau Public. And what I'm gonna do is bring Tableau onto the screen now. Mouse has decided not to work. Pretty helpful. Okay, I have to use my trackpad. Okay, so this is Tableau Public. This is, as I said, this is the free version of Tableau. And the interface is the same. There are a few differences, and I will go into those in a second. Um, you can see on the left hand side in this blue section, this is where we have all of our data connections in Tableau public, which is what we're using. You are kind of limited on what you can connect to. So you have some uh, file based data sources and under the to a server section, we have some uh, some other ones. So it's Google Drive, OData, um, Web Data Connector. So not a huge amount of choice there. What I'm going to do quickly is just show you by contrast Tableau desktop, the fully paid version, which is this one I'm bringing onto the screen now, you'll see that list is, it has the same sort of file-based options there, but where it says to a server, you can see now we can connect to you know, multiple different databases, um, cloud-based data sources, et cetera. So um, there's also a limit on the size of data you can connect to in Tableau public. I can't exactly remember what it is, but um, there's no there's no size limit to the, the main Tableau desktop product. But for what we're doing today, Tableau public will be absolutely fine. So this section is divided into three, well, this screen is divided into three parts. The blue section, as I said, is the, um, the data connections options. In the middle, every time you open a file, you'll get a thumbnail. You probably saw on my Tableau desktop that I had a few there. Um, I haven't opened anything in Tableau public, so I don't really use it. Um, so that's blank probably will be on yours as well. And on the right hand side, we've got some how to videos. Um, we have a link to the Tableau public website, which is really cool. And I'll show you that later on um, about visit of the day um, and some other resources as well. So some, some more data sets, some blogs, etc. What we're going to do, though, is connect to that data source that I ask you to download. And if you remember, let me flick back quickly to to the web and the link is in the chat and we're downloading sample EU Superstore, which is there. Okay, so what we're going to choose is Microsoft Excel because that's what we want to connect to. And you'll be taken through to a, a normal kind of file explorer type interface. And what you're going to do is find that data set sample EU Superstore and connect to it. I'm on a Mac here. Um, if you're on a Windows machine, it's, it's pretty much the same. And then click open. Please, can you go a few steps back? Of course. Okay, starting from here. Or do you want to see the data set as well? Uh, it, it took ages to open. It's just open, ah, so I'm just behind. I, <laughs> I just need to okay. connect to the data set, sorry. No problem. Cool. So when you see the screen, um, we're going to go in the top left-hand corner of the blue section, and we're going to choose Microsoft Excel. And let's, let's click on that. And then after that, you're going to navigate to wherever you saved that spreadsheet that you've just downloaded. And just click on it and click open and Tableau will load it up. Now in the full desktop version, you will get a data preview here and it'll, it'll summarize um, the columns that you can see and some other stuff as well, but we'll see actually how that will happen when we drag, we drag something in. So, 
just bear with me. What I'm going to do as well is I'm going to open up that. Um, I'm going to open up that spreadsheet just so we can have a look at it first. And I'd really recommend that you that you do this, regardless of whether you're using Tableau or not. It's a really good idea to to have a look and just have a a, a scout around your data just to get an idea of what what values you have in it, um, and also just get a feel for, for what's going on. So this is the spreadsheet here. If I just take off our filters, what we've got is some fictional data about um, a, a superstore. This is Tableau's training data. It's not the most interesting of data, but it's quite useful for things like this because there's some good trends built into it. Um, if I just freeze the pane, here we go. We can see that we have uh, some data relating to our orders here. So we have an order ID. Seems like there are multiple transactions within an order. We can see that because each order ID has multiple rows. We can then see the date that that order was placed, the date it was shipped, how it was shipped, and then some customer information as well. So who bought, who, who ordered this order, who bought this order? Uh, so we can see an, an individual ID for a customer, their name, um, what area they work in, city, state, country, etc., where they live, um, what they bought as well. So within those orders, we can see for that first one, we can see that this person bought these products within that order. And then as we as we go over to the right hand side, we can see that we've got so my mouse is packed in. So let me just. So on the right hand side, we can see we've got our metrics here, sales, quantity, discount, and profit. Okay. So in the top, the top one, for example, this transaction involved three fellows folders blue. The total was 79.2 pounds. There was zero discount applied. And the profit we made on that particular transaction was 39.6 pounds. Okay. So as we go back to Tableau, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to use our orders tab. You can see in our in our spreadsheet we've got three tabs: we've got orders, returns, and people. Um, if you come back tomorrow, we're going to do some joins in Tableau, which will involve using different tabs and different files. But for today, we're just going to be concerning ourselves with orders. Mary, can we get the CSV? Uh, I don't have a CSV of that, I'm afraid. Are you having trouble connecting to it? You have access to the um, to the Google Drive, so you should be able to download it in Excel format if you want to. Okay, on the left-hand side here, we can see that we've got our three different tabs. Underneath, we've got what looks like duplicates, but these are actually named ranges. The named range in Excel is where you can actually identify certain areas of the spreadsheet. Um, to be called different things. Uh, we're going to ignore those for today um, and concentrate only on orders, people, and returns. And you can see that as you hover over these different tabs, you get this little grid icon called View Data. So you can actually click on that and you can see that that same data, but in Tableau instead. And we can see that there's 10,000 rows, 20 fields. And each of them have a different data type at the top. You can see we've got a calendar icon for dates. We've got ABC for string fields or text fields. And then the right hand side, we have these hash signs, which are um, indicating that it's a number. So I'm going to click on that. And what we're going to do is just drag our orders into the middle here, drag tables, where it says drag tables here. And we can see that same data populated now in Tableau, and this is ready to use. And we get some kind of metadata about our data set. We can see there's 20 fields and 10,000 rows. Tableau gives us a preview of 100 rows of data. You can see that in the right-hand side here. And what we can see there is that all Tableau is doing is trying to, to give us uh, an insight 
into what the data looks like and whether whether Tableau has actually imported our data correctly or not. Okay, and it's doing that because we could, in theory, be connected to a database with hundreds of millions of rows, and we don't want Tableau to have to render all of that data because it would slow everything down. So it's just giving us a little snapshot. You can overwrite that if you want and put it a thousand rows or, or whatever, um, but it's just really intended for you to, to eyeball it and just check that everything's okay. We get some metadata down here on the left-hand side. So we get our field name, our physical table and remote field. So physic physical table is the tab that it came from. And one second. Yeah. If the field name has been renamed, if you, you can rename fields here, that will change the remote field name as well, but we don't have to worry about that today. So we're just gonna minimize this, um, this little pane and there's this little arrow, you can click on that and just minimize it so you can see more of, of the data that's been imported. If Tableau has incorrectly brought data in, uh, which happens sometimes, but not very often, um, you can click on any of these icons for the, the data type and just reallocate um, a different data type to it. Okay, we have these uh, little uh, globe icons as well. So that, that indicates a geographic field. Tableau has a really powerful inbuilt geographic database, uh, which will allow you to create maps. Um, and it's always looking for, for clues in the in the data, you know, in the headers of the data to, to determine whether that's a, a geographical field or not. We can do some other things on here. Sometimes if you have a, a a spreadsheet which has been formatted with merged cells or missing rows, that sort of thing. You can use the data interpreter, uh, top left. In this case, um, we don't need to. Tableau and other BI tools prefer to have just one row of headers and then all the data underneath it. But sometimes you do get you know, nicely formatted spreadsheets, which, which look nice, but actually when you put them into other systems, they, they cause a few headaches. But the data interpreter goes some way to resolving that. Top right of the screen, this is an area that's kind of overlooked a little bit, uh, data source filters. And another thing I'd urge you to do is, is to really try and trim down the data that you're looking at where possible. So it may be that, for example, you're looking at a data set with 20 years worth of data in it, but really you're only interested in the last three. Why not filter out the other 17 years? And that means your computer isn't have to, having to do extra work uh, in order to process that. You could do that in here if you wanted to. Don't worry about following along with this. But for example, if I wanted to, to filter by country, I could just filter for Austria. I now have a filter in there. And you'll notice that the data underneath updates, and there's only 270 rows relating to Austria. And you can see that they all relate now to, to Austria. But I'm going to get rid of that for, for our purposes today. Right. Let's go into sheet one at the bottom of the screen next to where it says data source. And this is where we create our, our charts and our, and our dashboards. So in Tableau, when you see a dashboard, each of the different charts in that dashboard will have been made in a separate tab. So each tab that you create houses a separate chart. And then those, those different charts are brought together to create a dashboard and then you make them interactive. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, build, um, we'll build a dashboard based on imagining that we are in charge of this business. Okay? We want to find out some more insights into how our business is, is operating. And another good idea when you're analyzing data is to ask yourself some, some broad questions so you can narrow down your, your approach. Uh, sometimes if you connect to a really huge data set, then it can be a bit overwhelming and you don't know where to start. But normally the, the W questions, so who, what, when, where, et cetera, um, are quite good, quite good places to start because they can, they can really guide your analysis a bit more. Um, so if we're running this business, we probably want to know how much money or we're making from sales, what we're selling, et cetera. Um, so what we're going to do is create a chart um, based on our, our subcategory field. And you'll notice that all of our fields from our spreadsheet are on the left-hand side and they've been categorized into blue or green 
fields. Um, anything categorical is called a dimension in Tableau Talk, and that gets given a blue, a, a blue pill, we'll call it. So when you hover over these things, you'll see something that looks a, a bit pill-shaped um, come up. Anything that's green underneath is called a measure, and Tableau calls these continuous. And a good way to think about it is, imagine if you're baking a cake, you need three eggs. Eggs are, wait one second. I, I believe the recording will be shared, Marcy. Um, I'm not sure how, uh, you have to ask someone from, from the JGI. Um, okay, so discrete and continuous, baking a cake, weird analogy, but, um, if, you, if you're baking a cake, you need three eggs. Eggs are kind of finite, they're discrete. You know how many you need. Um, you also will need water. So water, can, water is continuous in this case. You'll have a jug with a scale and you might need 25 mils, you might need 30 mils, whatever. That's a continuous measure as opposed to a discrete item. So let's take our first discrete field subcategory and put that onto rows. And you can see here that Tableau has listed out all of the, the dimension members from that column in our data. Okay. If any of you have used Excel before and used pivot tables, this will behave in exactly the same way. And in actual fact, if you, if you do use pivot tables, you'll, you'll notice a similarity with how Tableau works. Okay. In, in pivot tables in Excel, you'd have something on rows, something on columns, and a value in the middle that would be text. The differences with Tableau, that value in the middle can be visual. So we can see these are all our subcategories. And if we want to see how many or how much of each one we've sold, we can go to our sales measure on the left-hand side at the bottom, drag that to columns. And you'll notice that wherever you, whenever you drag anything out, there are some orange areas of the screen. And that's indicating that you can drop whatever you've picked up in those areas. So I'm just going to release sales onto the bit that says columns at the top. And now we have a bar chart. And Tableau's created that for us. It hasn't asked us whether we want a bar chart. You'll see we have uh, something that says automatic um, in our marks card. I'm trying to zoom in, but my mouse isn't working, unfortunately. Um, but you can see it says here automatic. That's Tableau saying from the fields that you've selected, this is the best chart type based on the, the nature of those fields. So, and in most cases, a cap in the categorical data, a bar chart is absolutely the best chart to use because our, our eyes pick up uh, length very efficiently if we're talking about pre-attentive sensory attributes. Um, we've probably all seen those pie charts with thousands of different segments very difficult to tell which segment is bigger or whether one segment is bigger than the other. You don't get that problem with, with length and bar charts. So Tableau will always, almost always give you um, a bar chart in this situation. What we're also gonna do is at the top of the screen where it says standard, there's a drop down, and we're going to make this the entire view. That's just gonna fill the screen for you and make the best use of the, the, the available space. Let's talk a little bit about the icons along the top in the menu, uh, in the menu bar. Now, the very first one, it looks like a Tableau logo. That means show start page. And it's like a toggle between that initial load up screen and where we are now creating charts. And in actual fact, you don't really need to use that, uh, but it is there. We have uh, an undo or a back button. Uh, in Tableau, the back button is your friend. So uh, you can go back as many times as you want um, since you opened the file, even before you last saved it. Uh, in Excel, you can only go back a certain amount of times before it stops. Um, in Tableau, if you, if you go further down the line and realize you've made a mistake, you can go back and back and back and back and back until you find the point where you made that mistake and correct it. Um, we have a, a redo or a forward button. That's grayed out because we haven't done anything at the moment to. Um, to turn that on. I'm not going to talk about all of these. Um, there's the save uh, save icon. This is one of the main differences of Tableau Public. 
um, as opposed to Tableau Desktop, but we'll, we'll get to that when we finished our dashboard. We can add extra data sources into our dashboard as well. You get that same option from the, from the front screen if you click on that. You can have multiple data sources in a workbook. There's no real limit on it um, other than the computing power or the processing power of your computer. Um, but I'd, I'd really recommend that you, you be cautious with that if you're bringing in massive database folders or tables, then you might see a performance uh, issue. With this next icon, we can create a new worksheet, a new story, or a new dashboard. You can do exactly the same thing with the three icons right at the bottom next to where it says sheet one. They do, they do exactly the same thing. Um, there's always different ways of doing things in Tableau. Um, you kind of figure out after a while which one you prefer. Um, I, I tend to always use these tabs at the bottom. I find it a bit quicker. Um, we have a, the next one is a duplicate sheets option as well. And what that will do is if you spend time formatting a particular chart, you know that you want to use that formatting on the next chart that you create, then what you can do is just spend your time formatting one chart, duplicate it and swap out the fields for, for the next one. And that saves you a bit of time. If you decide that, that what you've created, you just don't want to keep, maybe um, you haven't found any insights or you want to just start from scratch, you can use the clear sheet button, which is the one with the bar chart, which looks, looks like an, it's got a little X in the corner. If I click on that, everything goes blank, but I can use my back button or undo button to bring that back if I want to. The next icon, is the swap rows and columns. This is quite cool. It changes the orientation of your chart. So if I wanted this to be a vertical bar chart, I could click on that and we can see that we can toggle between vertical or horizontal. I would suggest to you that if you're looking at categorical data in a bar chart, then horizontal is almost always better because you can read the labels much better, much more easily. At the moment, if we have this vertically, because it's using the whole screen, we can see the headers pretty easily. But if we give that less space on a dashboard, what Tableau will do is, is flip the headers and we'll have to twist our heads to read them all. And it's not ideal. Having said that, if you're looking at temporal data in a bar chart, which is absolutely fine to do, normally line charts and bar charts are the best way to look at, best ways to look at, um, at time-based data, then absolutely use a vertical one because we associate the movement of time with a left right movement so we, we want that in a vertical bar chart but for the moment i'm just going to flip that back to be a horizontal bar chart because it's easier to understand we probably want to sort our chart as well the next two icons very similar to to excel and um, are sorting icons sort ascending so the smallest numbers at the top or descending with the largest numbers at the top we can also sort Right on the axis, you see where it says sales on the x-axis, there's a little sorting icon down there. We could also click on that and it will sort our bar chart for us. Next thing we want to decide is, do we want to have an axis or labels on our bars? My personal preference is for labels. I, I find that they look, um, they look nicer and they take up less space. When you design a dashboard, your screen real estate, the amount of space on your screen is at a premium. So you need to be making sure that you use that as effectively as possible, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're going to click the next icon along, um, or two icons along from the descending sort, and it's like a T in a hashed square, and that's show mark labels. So we're gonna click on that. You'll notice the values appear at the end of the bar. And what that means is we can actually get rid of our axis. We don't need it anymore. Because what we're doing now is something called double encoding. We're duplicating information and we're wasting space on the screen, introducing uh, more ink onto the screen, etc. So what we can do is right click on the X axis at the bottom. So the whole thing will, um, will light up. And where it says show header with a tick next to it, if you click on that, that will get rid of our axis for us. If you want to get that header back for whatever reason, you can press your back button, that will work. But 
our green pills, our continuous pills, they always are associated with an axis. They always give us an axis. Our blue pills slice our data. So in this case, our green, our green field is giving us the total value for all of our sales in our data set. The introduction of the blue field slices that value into different values for each of our subcategories. Okay. So we know we've got a green field in here. If we click on the little triangle to the right of our sum of sales and choose show header, that will bring our axis back, okay? Because that axis belongs to that particular field. I'm gonna get rid of that because I don't want it. What we probably want to do as well is to format our values. So at the moment, they're just coming out as numbers and in the interest of clarity for our dashboard, we want to make sure that all of the information we present is as clear as possible. Imagine you know, we, we work with, for example, UBS Bank. They have 10,000 Tableau users across their organization. If you publish something uh, for consumption across the bank that isn't clear, you're going to get inundated with emails from people saying, what does this mean? I don't understand it. Please make it clearer. And very soon, that's going to be pretty tiresome. So you need to make sure right at the beginning that everything is specified um, as clearly as possible. And currency in this case is probably quite important. But we're going to format our sales and our profit fields um, to be pounds. And the way we do that is you can right click on the field itself on the left or click the little triangle. It does exactly the same thing, up to you. And what we're going to say is we're going to go to default properties and then number format. So we right clicked on sales, go down to default properties, then number format, click on that and you get this little box appear now. And you get some different options here. What we're gonna choose is currency custom. And I don't want any decimal places on this because they're pretty large numbers. I'm going to just drop that down to zero by pressing the down arrow. We can choose how we see negative sales. Um, in this case, we probably won't have any negative sales. So I'm just gonna leave that as a minus, that's fine. We can, if we want to abbreviate the values to thousands, millions, billions, et cetera. But again, I'm just gonna leave that. And then depending on how your computer is set up with, with its locale, um, Tableau will populate uh, a pound sign if you're, set, if you're set up as a UK computer or dollar as a, a US computer or whatever. But you can just overwrite it. If your computer says something different to a pound sign, you can overwrite it if you want to. And when we've got it set up like this, I'm just gonna click okay. I'm happy with that. You'll notice that our labels now have pound signs on the end at the beginning. And let's do exactly the same thing for our profit field as well. So I'm just gonna right click on profit, go down to default properties and number format. And I'm going to choose currency custom again. Go down to zero decimals and leave everything else exactly the same. And then click OK. Cool. So hopefully. Hopefully you're all at this point. Uh, if you want me to go over anything, please do just, just let me know. Um, okay, so what we'll now see, now we've done profit as well, is when we add profit in, which we're doing next, um, that will also be a pound um, or designated as a currency as well. So at the moment, we can see what we're selling. We can see that we're selling 365Ks worth of, of copiers, et cetera. We don't really know whether we're making any money on these sales or not. So luckily we do have a profit field. We know we saw from our, our spreadsheet, we have a column for profit on each transaction and we can grab our profit and let's put profit onto color. Yeah, you'll see you have this area called the marks card and this is kind of central to how Tableau works and how you can control the appearance of your charts. And profit has been dropped onto color now. And you'll notice that each bar is associated now, the color of it is associated with how much profit there is. And because values with profit can be negative, Tableau has automatically chosen 
a, what's known as a diverging color palette. And you can see in the top right corner, we've got this color legend. Uh, the values range from you know, minus 21K through to 56K. Okay, Jin, what you need to do is press the little T at the top in the top menu. There's a T with a hash line. If you press that, the labels will appear. Hopefully that's worked. Okay. Tableau has selected blue and orange for color scheme. Why not? Perfect. Why not red and green? Anyone tell me? Yeah. Well done, Jason. Red green color blindness is, is very common. And what, what you'll find is that, particularly in, in large organizations, I can't remember the exact stats. I think it's one in eight. One in eight men are, are, are red green color blind. I think it's slightly less common with women. Um, but if you publish something that people can't see, then you're going to get, again, a load of queries asking you to change it. So um, blue and orange is is colorblind friendly, basically. Um, so Tableau chooses that automatically. And what we can see now is when we hover over our, our bars, we can see that profit is now in the tooltip. Yeah, I haven't thought about it like that, Jason. Good point. Print software in black and white. Um, so here we go. We can see our profit values um, are in the tooltip as well. The tooltip is the information that comes up when you hover over something. Um, and there we go. So that's our first chart in Tableau. And we're going to rename this chart. And where it says sheet one at the bottom, very much like with, with Excel, if you double click on the tab name, we can change this to, I'm just going to call it bars. Right. What you'll also notice in Tableau, in the top right corner, you have something called Show Me. And this is a like a chart building wizard. And we deliberately as a company don't use this uh, when we when we do training. Um, it doesn't really give you any appreciation of, of how Tableau works. Um, I'll give you a little illustration in a second, but it is there if you want. Um, I'd rec my recommendation would be not to use it because you won't learn Tableau as quickly as if you do things like we're doing, you know, dragging, dragging fields in um, as you need them. Let's start a brand new worksheet. You can choose the icon at the top, a little bar chart with a plus, or you can right next to where it says bars, you can click on that tab and start sheet two. And don't worry about following along for this bit. We're gonna build a different chart, but I'll just show you quickly um, what Show Me does. You'll notice as I click on various fields, some of these chart types get ungrade. Um, and if I, if I select multiple ones and in a measure, you'll see that all of a sudden I can use any of these chart types with what I've selected. And we can just click on some to see what they look like. And you can see why sometimes they don't work very well. I mean, that's. That's a great example of why pie charts aren't very good. Um, so yeah, just be careful with using show me because it doesn't give you the results always that you, <laughs> that you expect or you necessarily want. So what we're going to do next is we're going to build a map out of this. And as mentioned, we can see that we've got some geographic fields in our data. We've got that little globe icon next to country, state, and city. And what Tableau has done here is quite clever. Um, Tableau knows that there's a hierarchy in geographies. So it knows that cities belong to states and states beyond, belong to countries. And where it notices those things, it will group them together and allow you to drill down into them. Uh, it's called a hierarchy. And we can create these manually. We'll, we'll try doing that in a second, actually, because it's quite useful. But to create a map, uh, all we need to do is double click on a geographic field. So we're going to double click on country here. And you'll notice that Tableau 
has given us a map now of Europe. This is a European data set. And wherever there's a blue circle over a country, that means that we have values associated with that country in our data set. Right? So at the moment, it's not really doing anything other than showing us where, you know, which countries are represented in our data. And we have a couple of options with maps. We can, we can choose between a shape map or a filled map. We'll create both, just so you see how, how we can do that. Um, we'll do a shape map first. And what we're going to do is grab our sales value and drag it to our marks card and put that onto size. And just release it onto there. What you'll notice now is those circles have been resized to represent the, the sales value for that particular country. I'm also going to go in and make these a little bit bigger. I'm going to click on that size button. And when I do that, there's a little slider and I can increase the size of these circles. Some of the smaller countries were difficult to, difficult to see. So we can make them quite big if we want to make it a bit easier. The cool thing about these maps is that we can represent more than one measure visually as well. So we could do the same thing as we did with our, um, with our bar chart and we could drag profit onto color. We wanted to here. So I'm going to grab profit and drag that onto color. And we can see immediately that France has got the highest sales in this data set, followed by Germany, followed by the UK. And that's the size of the circle determining that. But we can see also that the Netherlands, based on the color, are doing really badly. So they're they're losing us 41,000 pounds per year. So maybe we want to have a think in our business about boosting the, the, net, the Dutch business a bit more. We have some options as well with maps. So if we, if we click up right to the top of the screen, you'll see in the top menu, there's a section that says map. If we click on that, there's all sorts of things you can do with maps here. You can, you can bring in custom maps. There's a, a, a website called mapbox.com. Uh, you can see that actually it's referenced in the bottom corner of the map on your screen. Um, you can create custom maps. So I've seen people do pirate maps and cartoon maps and all sorts of things. And you can actually bring them into Tableau if you want to um, as a background map. You can also, if we look at um, background layers, we click on that. We can see that we've got some options in here about um, different levels of detail in the map. Uh, also the appearance as well. So right at the top, Tableau defaults to a light map, which is with a white sea and gray land mass. We can change that to being a normal sea if we want to with a, a just sort of light blue. Uh, we could change it to being a dark map. These can look quite cool if you're creating a, a dark themed dashboard. Um, a few others, so see streets, satellite. Etc. I'm going to leave it just as the normal one, which is light, because that goes quite well with a, a light theme dashboard. We can wash out the background if we want to as well. So if we wanted just the, the values, that doesn't really make much sense with a with a shape map, more with a filled map. Uh, we can do that. And then you'll notice that we can. Well, we've got these values on the left-hand side, these map layers. Some of them are grayed out. That means that we're too far out for them to be, um, you know, to be, to make sense. But we can zoom in um, in different areas. So um, I'm just going to zoom in here. You can use your mouse. If your, if your mouse is working, like mine isn't, you can use your scroll, um, your scroll, scroller thing, <laughs> whatever it's called. Um, I'm just going to double click and zoom in. And as you zoom in, you can see that some of these things become available to you to use. So we could put in, uh, we do streets and highways, for example. Obviously, when you're zoomed out, it doesn't, it's not that relevant to have the streets and highways because you're not, you know, you, you wouldn't see them. They'd be really messy. We could put county names. Various other other things, yeah, you can go crazy with some of the detail in this, but uh, it doesn't really make sense to do that. If you're using if you're using a map, try and 
try and keep it as clean as possible if you can. Okay, and you'll see these controls, this little control panel top left of your map. Whenever that map pin has a little X next to it, that means that you've changed the perspective from the default. So if you click on that, it will then flip you back um, to the original kind of layout. Cool, so let's call this a shape map. And we're gonna create a filled map this time. So let's start a brand new worksheet. Hopefully you're all following along okay. The starting point of a shape of a, of a filled map, sorry, is exactly the same. So we're gonna double click on country. And this time we're just gonna do this with profit. So the, the downside of a filled map is that you can only use one measure visually, but the upside is if you're putting it onto a dashboard, it, it gives really nice, um, you know, easy to hit buttons. Um, for people to interact, whereas some of the circles on the shape map conversely were really small. So um, what we're going to do this time is just grab profit and we're going to put this straight onto color. And you'll see now that we have um, these polygons or shapes of each country and each shape is color coded based on the value of the profit um, for that particular country. If we wanted sales as well, what we could do is grab sales and drop that onto tooltip on the March card. So we could grab that. Put that on there. And now we have our sales appearing in the information that comes up when you hover. Other ways to interact with the map. So you can zoom in using the plus or minus, you can search for um, a particular place using the little magnifying glass. And this little play button, a little horizontal triangle, allows different ways for you to interact. So you have a, a pan, which to I never use. If you just hold down your mouse, you'll see that your, um, your cursor goes to a little crosshair icon, which is exactly the same. And you can drag the map around if you want to. Um, but then, what you can also do is select values on the map as well. And that's where these three little shapes at the end come in. So by default, Tableau is a has a rectangular selection. So that's when you, you click and drag, you get a rectangle. You can change that to being a radius as well. So when you click and drag, it goes out from the middle of a circle. And the last one you can choose is the lasso selection where you can actually draw freehand around different countries to select them if you want to. Right, so a few different options there, depends on how you want your user to interact with your, um, with your map. So we'll call this filled map. What I'd like you to do next is to actually duplicate this sheet. Now you can use the icon right at the top or Another way to do the same thing is to right click on the name of the tab at the bottom. So filled, filled map in this case, and choose duplicate. So as it suggests, that will give you a duplicate of whatever sheet that you choose. And you'll notice that where we've got um, our country field, so Tableau automatically, when you double click on it, automatically adds it to detail. So the detail is the, the level of granularity of that chart. So the level of detail in this particular chart is country. And you can press on this little icon, this little, uh, little plus icon next to where it says country. And because we have this hierarchy on the top left of country, state and city, you can drill down into that hierarchy. So this is now by state. And it's important to, to note that in terms of geography, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland are all counted as states. So the country itself is the UK, obviously, um, but England, Scotland, et cetera, they share the same geographic significance as say Normandy in France. We can go down one more level in this hierarchy if you want to, down to city. We press that one more time. Tableau will give us little circles this time. Um, because obviously cities are comparatively small compared to a country, uh, geographically speaking. Also, 
they tend not they tend to be growing all the time so you know the shapes of a city will will change over time Navigator. okay what we're going to do though is go back up one level to states and just leave it there so if you press the minus sign next to state if you've gone down to city that will take you up to to state and what we're going to do before we move on is we're going to add some labels to this it's going to look terrible at first but it will make sense um, when you see what we do with it later and i'm going to grab the state name and put that onto label so i'm going to grab that and just drop that onto label here and i'm also going to grab the profit value and put that onto label too okay so you should have something that looks like that i would never advocate putting labels on like this but we're doing something specific with this um, afterwards so let's call this state map And for our last chart that we're going to create, we're going to look at how Tableau deals with dates. Okay, so let's start a brand new tab, new worksheet. And we're going to use order dates here. Now, dates are quite unique in Tableau because they can be blue and they can be green as well, uh, continuous or discrete. And we'll show, well, I'll show you a little example of, of the differences between the two. So let's, let's grab our order date and drag it out and put that onto columns. And we're gonna create a sales profile for our business here. And we need sales as well. So we're gonna grab sales and put that onto rows. And that's the shape of our sales over the last four years. So this data set goes from 2015 through 2018. You'll notice as well at the top, Tableau's defaulted to a year. It's a blue year, that's the default uh, kind of format of, of dates when you first use them and you have that little plus icon as well and what Tableau does is it it works out a hierarchy of dates for you so in, in in some softwares you have to specify a column for year a column for quarter column for month column for day and then it puts them all together Tableau in our spreadsheet you'll notice that we only have one column for order date and Tableau will work out all of the hierarchies um, based on one column which is pretty cool and we can drill down into this you can see we can go down into quarter. We can go down further if we want to. But with blue dates, it starts getting a bit messy and it doesn't all fit on the screen as well. So you can see here that we're going really wide here. So if you're getting charts like this, you probably don't want a blue date, um, but we'll, we'll look at the green date option in a second. What I'm gonna do is go back up to quarter and just leave it at quarter. So we can see here that we're using a blue, a blue pill. That means it's discrete, it's slicing our data. So our line is sliced, in this case, by year. Okay, and we have our quarters along the bottom. So we can see the yearly profile by quarter for each of our years quite, quite easily. Um, if we wanted to see, for example, wanted to, to perform some analysis to see how our quarters have been performing over the years, we could just add up or pick a, pick a particular quarter quarter two in this case, look at the values, make a mental note of them in our short-term memory and add them up, but that'd be pretty manual. The easy thing to do in this case would be to grab our year and put year the other side of quarter. That means now the pane or these, the pane is a tableau term for these big rectangles. Um, kind of the, the top level granularity there is, is is quarter and the more detailed level of granularity is year. So now we can see that actually our quarter twos were, were pretty good. They went up consistently. Quarter three, something happened between 2016, 2017, and we plateaued, even went down a little bit between those two quarter threes. So maybe something we, we'd want to investigate um, in our business. But for the moment, I'm going to move quarter back to, to how it was to the other side of year. So now we've got year at the top and quarter at the bottom. And dates are pretty flexible in Tableau. So maybe we're creating a dashboard and we've got a, a small narrow section at one side that we want to fill. Um, we could have this chart. We could move quarter down next to, next to sales. Have it that way. Or we could 
could do it this way instead. And view it by year. So depends depends on how you want to see it, but those options are all there for you. Okay, so this is a this is a blue date. And of course, we can also introduce other blue fields into here. So if we wanted to, to look at this analysis by region, for example, we could grab region and put region onto color, and that will split that line into however many regions there are. So we can see that the blue now doesn't mean everything, it means our central region, yellow is north and red is south. So let's call this blue date, blue dates. And then we're gonna create one more chart and call this green dates. This is where we'll use a continuous date. So our line won't get broken up. So if we want to go down into much more detail, it'll all fit on one screen and it'll look, it'll look better. So we're gonna grab order date again, and put that onto columns. So we're gonna start it exactly the same way. Grab sales, put that onto rows as well. Now what we're gonna do when you've got to this point is click on the little triangle or, or right click on year when it's on columns. And you get this kind of date related interface that pops up. And you'll notice there are two sections in the middle and there's one that's ticked so year that's ticked that's blue so this section at the top is your blue discrete dates and the section underneath will be our green continuous dates so what i want you to do is just click onto the, the second year and tableau has taken that exact same chart and basically put it out um, across across the screen so the chart is actually the same it's just been given more space the difference is now we have an axis. Remember our green fields give us an axis. So if I try and click on an individual year, I can't, I can only click on the axis itself. With a blue date, I can click on individual years if I want to. That's because they're headers as opposed to axes. And now what happens if we drill down, I'm gonna press that little plus icon as well. You'll notice as we drill down, that line doesn't become broken and it becomes much easier to see a, a broader time span on one screen. We can go right the way down to day if we want to. Slightly annoying thing about this is if you want to go back up the hierarchy, the minus sign, for some reason, I don't know why Tableau do this, but for some reason for green dates, the minus sign is just at the intersection of the two axes in the bottom left corner of the chart. So we can press that at minus, and we'll go back up to quarter and have it to have it at the same level as the other one. And then we could put region, of course, into this as well. Uh, so the same thing's going to happen. We put region, we're going to get three lines instead of one. You'll notice the, the axis change scale as well. And there we go. So these two charts are essentially the same thing, but the blue dates slice up the line and the green dates don't. Okay, hopefully you're all you're all still with me. Um, what we're going to do next is start making a dashboard out of what we've created, and this is where you know we've already discovered some some insights into our into our business. And um, this is where we start being able to ask questions of our data as well. So we're going to choose now the middle icon at the bottom. This like looks like a window with a plus. So we're going to click on that, and. We get this interface here. This is our canvas for making dashboards. And it, it looks similar to, to our, our worksheet canvases, but a little bit different. Top left is where we can design dashboards for different devices. We're not going to do that, um, but that's where you control that. Um, what we are going to do is change the size of our dashboard. So Tableau defaults to this, um, this size of dashboard. Um, it's slightly different to Tableau desktop. Um, and we have some options here. If we click on, click on this, you can see it says min and max, that's a range. So depending on the size of monitor or the resolution of the computer that you're viewing it on, that dashboard will, will shrink or expand. And um, not always a great idea to do that because what looks great on your computer might not necessarily look good on others. So what we're going to do, it's a little cheat for you, is click on where it says range. And we're gonna choose fixed size. So we're gonna choose automatic. You'll notice the gray area disappear from your screen 
and that dashboard is now filling the screen to its maximum extent. And we're not going to keep it on automatic because, as I was saying, with a range, you might be designing a dashboard on a nice widescreen monitor, but you may be, it may be being consumed by someone on one of those old school square ones and everything will get squashed up and won't look very good. So what we're going to do, once we've changed it to automatic, we're going to change this to being fixed again. And that's going to fix it at the size of your screen that you're looking at it on. So you're going to be able to make the best use of, of your screen real estate. Now, some businesses um, have you know, business standards of certain dashboard sizes. They need to, you know, every, every dashboard has to be the same size and stuff. But um, for the moment, we're just going to do this because it's going to look better on your computer. And what we're going to do next is build our dashboard. So we're going to decide what we want to have on it. So I think we want to have our, our bars. They were pretty informative. So we can just left click and drag our bars onto the dashboard. So yeah, we've got nothing else on there at the moment. So it's filling everything. I think our, our filled map would be good to have on there as well. So I'm going to drag that on. You'll notice when you drag it on, I haven't released my mouse yet on my, my trackpad. And you'll notice when I move it, the cursor around, you get these gray outlines. And that's Tableau telling you where this chart will be dropped. So I'm going to drop that just on the left-hand side of the bars. I quite like that. And I think we'll use our, our green dates line as well. So what I'm going to do is put that underneath the bar chart. So I'm going to grab green dates and just drop that underneath the bars. What we can do is give our bars a little bit more space, depending on what, what computer you're viewing it on. You may lose some labels on your bar chart or it may look pretty squashed. You'll notice when you click into any of these charts, you get a gray container around the outside. I'm gonna click into my green dates chart and I can grab the top of that container and just drag it down. You get a little up and down arrow Line charts normally don't need as much space, so we can just drag it down a little bit um, and make it look a bit better for our bars. Okay, all good dashboards need a title. Bottom left corner of your screen, just above where it says data source, is a little checkbox saying show dashboard title. I'm going to click on that. You see we get dashboard one at the top. I'm going to click into that box and do exactly the same thing as I just did with the line chart and just drag it down, give it a bit more space. Next thing we want to do is give it a title. And to do that, we just double click into that where it says dashboard one, and you'll get a Microsoft Word type interface. And I'm going to call this European Profit and Sales. I'm going to make it bold, nice and big. And just because I can, I'm going to make it blue. Click OK. Now, a really good idea for, for titles. Titles are really important. At the moment, our charts are taking titles, the titles from Anirudh, bottom left corner of your screen. You've got a little checkbox saying show dashboard title. Try not to state the obvious in your chart titles because everyone can see that this is a filled map. Um, we don't need to tell our, our users that. It's not, not giving them any insight. So we can just double click in each of these titles and rename them exactly the same way as we change the title to the main dashboard, the main dashboard title. And a really good hint here is to ask a question in the title because that will help people, will give people a little bit of incentive to dive in and answer that question. So I could say something like, where are we profitable or unprofitable? I'm going to make this bold and I'm going to take the size down to 12 so it's not too big. And I'm going to click OK. And then we could do the same for the others. So for bars, I'm going to say, we're selling. 
make that 12 as well. And for our green dates, I'm going to say, what is our sales profile by region? Something like that. You get the idea. You can write what you want. Okay. So we've answered some business questions. We can see that the Netherlands are struggling profit-wise. Uh, we're not doing very well with tables in our business. And the central region is dominant in terms of our, of our sales and our business. The other two, north and south, kind of track pretty similarly. But really, the, the power of, of software like Tableau is where you can ask questions of the data and drill into it. So we need to, to do that. And, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail if you come to the session tomorrow. But for now, we're going to do the kind of the basic, um, the basic version of this. So if you click into the map, so you get the gray outline, you click into the white space in the map, you'll notice a little tab. And the third icon down is a little funnel saying users filter. Apologies if you can hear some, some noise in the background. My dog's just got dropped home for the dog walker. So it might get noisy. Um, so we've got this little funnel icon. Click on that, users filter. Do exactly the same um, with the other tabs. You'll see a little funnel in each one. Users filter, users filter, click all of those so they're white. What that means now is we can start asking questions of our data. So we can see, for example, that the Netherlands is losing us money. We knew that. But if we want to drill in and see in a bit more detail where they're losing us money, what products, we can click on the Netherlands. And now our bar chart will, will change and show us exactly which products we're struggling with. And you can see, obviously, the length of the bar still relates to, to the sales, but the profit is determined by the color. And you can see that because it's all brown, mostly, we can see we're losing money pretty much everywhere apart from on furnishings. Where we're only just breaking even. Or we could look at it the other way around. We could say, okay, I know we're struggling on tables, but which countries are we struggling with the tables? So if you click on tables and the other two charts update. So we can see that the UK is actually doing okay for tables, but Germany is doing really badly. So we can then go in and maybe we want to either close down our table business in Germany, stop selling them or, or increase marketing or try and turn things around like that. So you can drill down even further as well. So let's go with uh, let's go with the Netherlands, and I'm interested in I don't know our bookcases, for example. So if I click on bookcases, you can see that now we've got our sales profile for bookcases, and our profit value or sales value is matched. Um, what's in the bar. Okay, so quite a simplistic example, but you can drill right the way down, ask questions of the data and really explore how your business is doing. The last thing we're going to do uh, before we publish this is we have this state map. What we're going to do is actually put that into the tooltip of this map, which is pretty cool. It's called Vizin tooltips. So what I'd like you to do is go back into the filled map tab there's a little shortcut you can use for that. If you click into the map here on the dashboard, the icon just above that user's filter is a little arrow within a square called Go to Sheet. If you click on that, it will take you straight through to that sheet. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go into our tooltip button within this map. And you can make these look really nice. Um, we hope we're just leaving them at the basic formatting. Um, here, but you can make these look really nice. What I'd like you to do is move your cursor just to the end of, of those fields that are in there. And you can click on insert in the top right of that box. And then we have sheets. And what we want to put in is that state map. Okay, it's actually going to embed a sheet into the tooltip of our map. A bit of code saying that we put a sheet, a sheet called state map into this tooltip. Um, the dimensions of what's going to appear are 300 by 300. You can 
you can change that. Um, but just leave it as it is, click OK. What you'll notice now is when you hover over the countries, you'll see the, the profit values for each of these things. OK. There's one thing we need to do, though, and that is just to make sure that our filters are all affecting that um, that state map as well. Okay, and when you click on anything, you can see that things update, and what we get are these little actions created, and these are little fields that Tableau creates just to tell uh, the other charts what to filter to when something is clicked on. Okay, so we just need to make sure that we apply these to our state map as well. So with each of these ones that you can see, if you haven't got quarter, make sure you just click on click on the map on the timeline in the in the dashboard and that will appear. Um, click on these and say apply to worksheets. Um, what we're going to say is selected worksheets. And we want this to affect the state map as well. Okay. Okay. So what that means is our our values will update in that little map when we click on something. Okay. And when we go through to the dashboard, we can we can see that those tooltips are working and giving us a little bit more information on top of what we've got. Okay. Right. Hopefully you all followed along with that. The next question is what to do with it. Now in Tableau Public, the only option you have is to publish this to your Tableau Public profile. And I'll show you my one. And there are one second, here we go. Okay, so this is my one here. This is like a, a portfolio of all your work. And it's completely free to set up. It takes you a couple of minutes to do that. And then you can publish things to it. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is go back to my dashboard. And when we go save, uh, when we tell it to save, so it's a sort of icon at the top. We click on that, it asks you to log in. So I'm going to log in with my credentials. And put my password in as well. What this is going to do is publish this up to uh, here we go. I'm going to call this JGI dashboard and then save. This will publish it up to my Tableau public profile. And you can see now that that's exactly the same dashboard that we just created and you can still interact with it in exactly the same way. And drill down as you like. And you can share that URL with other people if you want them to be able to interact with it. Um, word of warning with Tableau Public, the clue is in the name. Um, anything uh, that is uh, published to this is in the public domain. I need to shut my door. My dog just opened it. I'm sorry. The perils of working from home. There we go. Um, yeah, the clue is in the name. So anything on, on here is, is open to public consumption. Um, so yeah, just bear that in mind. But it's a really good thing. If you're interested in working in data using Tableau in particular, your Tableau public portfolio is a great place. Um, to go and, and show off your work. You can see that uh, dashboard is there now. 
Um, these are all sorts of other things that I've been doing. Um, but yeah, there's a hell of a lot of opportunity now with, with Tableau uh, for a career. So I can really recommend um, using it. Okay. Uh, yes, you could. You could, John. Um, so John's question is, can you embed output to a web page? And if you click the little share icon, bottom corner, you get an embed code, um, which you can paste into a, a web uh, interface as well. So you can actually link to it. But again, just be careful with the data um, that you're, you're happy to share it and have other people using it. Um, there is, a time do other products in their, in their product suite where you can actually lock everything down and have it, have it private if it needs to be, but you have to pay for those. Okay. Um, got some slides to finish off. Uh, some key points to consider. This is quite important um, if you're thinking about going down the, the route of data visualization a little more. Uh, framing, this is, this is quite cool. So it'll allow you to not manipulate your audience, but if there's a particular angle or, or mood or, or particular feeling you want people to take away from what you're designing, then you can think about how you represent that. So. An example is, is this dashboard from the, the South China Morning Post, um, it's dealing with the conflict in Iraq, obviously quite a dramatic title. It's an upside down bar chart made to look like, um, Jim, yes, you can. I'll, I'll show you how to do that before we finish. Um, obviously this is shown as a dramatic, for dramatic effect, like dripping blood, um, but we could look at this in a different way. So we could flip it up the other way. We could actually paint a more positive picture of this and say Iraq deaths on the decline, because obviously, you know, there were a lot of deaths there and that the situation is still very serious, but it's got better. And then we could also change it to being a less, uh, less dramatic color as well. So you could represent this in two different ways. Okay. Um, kind of up to you. Um, Things to avoid, there are loads of things to avoid. I, I would suggest to you, uh, hopefully I don't offend anyone, but I would suggest to you to avoid Fox News anyway. Um, but if you're interested in, in bad data visualization, I would say absolutely get, get stuck into Fox News because they are by far and away the worst proponents of data visualization on a global scale. There's quite a few examples of these. Um, and bear in mind, these go out on international television as well. So bottom left, we have a, a pie chart that adds up to 193%. Um, on the right-hand side, this, this bar chart relates to uh, Donald Trump's wall that he wanted to build between Mexico and, uh, and the US. And what it's showing is the amount of people who kind of allegedly got apprehended at, at the border. Um, what it's doing is quite is quite sneaky here because they're not starting the axis at zero. So that means that the, the, the difference between the bar lengths is really exaggerated. If these were going down to zero, the length, the, the differences between those bars would be much, um, you know, would appear to be much less. Um, this one, I actually don't know how they've done it. This is to do with COVID cases and yeah, you can see the axis. I mean, it, it starts at 30, goes up in increments of 30 till it gets to 100 when it goes up by 10 from 90. Then it goes up by 30 again. Then it goes up by 50, 190 to 240. Then by 10 to 250. Then by 50 again. Um, so I don't, I don't really know how they've done this. It's, it's not a, it's not a logarithmic axis. I think, I think they've just done it in PowerPoint and put random numbers in there and, and circulated it to everyone who watches them. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty strange. Pie charts I'd suggest avoiding anyway, unless you have a maximum of four segments. Um, if you, they're quite, they're quite effective at showing, I don't know if you want to show a gender split or something like that, probably a pie chart would be effective, but you know, if you have any more than four, segments, you're better off using a bar, a bar chart easily. Um, dual axis charts with wildly different scales. Um, that's the other option here on 
on the screen. Um, just be careful of those as well, because they can be misleading. People have to actually spend much more time looking at the scales and figuring out exactly what they're looking at. Um, cognitive load. You've probably seen how easy it is now to create something in Tableau. People tend to, um, to confuse complexity with, uh, with good work. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, with data visualization, you want to be trying to keep everything as simple as possible. If your dashboard is getting too crowded, then create another dashboard and there are ways to link between them in Tableau and drill down into other dashboards if you want to. Uh, this is an example. I mean, cognitive load is the amount of work our brains need to do to understand something. Um, this is just an overload. If you were looking for a specific advert on here, you really struggle. I think it's a Norwegian classified ads um, page. But yeah, pretty impossible to find anything on there. Um, this would be an example from Tableau using really granular charts. Um, bubble charts, like you can see on the screen, they, they have very limited value as well. Um, it's very difficult to tell the difference between sizes of circles, particularly when there are thousands of them like that. Um, word clouds, they look cool, but longer words can have smaller values than, than smaller words and bigger font. Um, if that makes sense. Um, it's difficult to, if you can standardize the length of the word, so I saw quite an effective one with um, passenger numbers at airports the other day, because all airport codes are three letters long. Um, it takes out the, the issue that you know, longer words can appear to have bigger values. Color blindness, we talked about this before. Um, there was a recent Six Nations game between Wales and Ireland. And normally in football, I know they change, they change the strips around, but they didn't do this for the, the rugby game. So colorblind viewers could, couldn't really tell the difference between the two teams, which was, um, yeah, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and this is the difference on the right hand side. I talked about blue and orange. So a, a red green colorblind person would see blue and orange as purple and green, but they would be able to see the difference between the colors, whereas green and red would appear like the right hand top bar chart there is the different shades of green. So quite an interesting little, uh, little comparison. This would be a good, a good dashboard in terms of design. Everything is, is put into different sections, clear sections with, uh, with nice titles, um, room to breathe for each of the charts between, um, between the different sections as well. So yeah, just uh, there's plenty of examples online. I will, I will send these slides around afterwards as well. So you'll have them. There are some resources here for you to to get going. Tableau's training videos are great. Uh, our YouTube channel, the Information Lab, has got thousands of videos on there. We also have a blog. Uh, Stephen Few is a, an excellent author on data visualization and uses Tableau as the illustrations in, in most of his books. Uh, Makeover Monday is a great, um, it's a great repository of data as well. And then Tableau Public, I'll talk briefly about shortly. Uh, if you're a student or an academic, you can get free licenses. Um, these are the links to do that. You'll have to provide uh, some uh, identification um, as a form to fill out, but Tableau will send you a license key and you can then um, put that into Tableau Desktop and have the full, the full fat version as well. Um, if any of you are, are interested in a career in data or a career in consulting, James, I'll, I'll send the slides around so you'll, you'll get all of these um, after, the, after the session. Um, there's a real shortage of skills in data analytics. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are, we are hiring 72 people a year uh, in London. If you're interested in a career in consulting or a career in data analytics, uh, please feel free to, um, to connect with me on LinkedIn. And you know, I'm happy to have a call with anyone uh, looking, for, looking for work. We're always looking for good people. And yeah, obviously the, the JGI ticks a lot of boxes in terms of background. Um, I looked at this this morning, actually, I, I periodically log into LinkedIn and look for how many Tableau jobs there are. And in London at the moment, there's almost 7,000 jobs asking for Tableau skills. That's in London alone. And there's a, a ton of opportunity out there. Um, there is a video embedded in here as well. Um, I won't play that for you now. Um, in terms of what we offer, um, it's a 28 month contract with us. Um, 
It's fully paid right from day one, including the four months of training, uh, £35,000 uh, for the training period and placements one and two, and 40000 for the remaining time you're with us. Uh, four four six-month consulting placements, I talked about those. Um, basically, we'll allocate you out to, to, to our clients as a consultant, and you'll do four different placements in, um, in different industries with different companies. We will pay for all professional certifications in Tableau and Altrix, also AWS and Snowflake that you would like to do. Um, it's a really fun company to work for. Um, we, yeah, we do a Christmas party every year. Um, this year it's in Barcelona in October and the whole company is going out there and we do activities and things like that. So it's really sociable, really fun. That's our website. That's the video, won't play it. And these are some of our clients. It's only a, a small kind of snapshot of these. Um, yeah, <laughs> Christmas log in Barcelona in, in October could be, could be melted, I think. Um, yeah, so that's that's us. I'll, I'll make sure these slides are sent around. But um, it's it's been great to to spend the last two hours with, with all of you. Um, I'm again, I'm really sorry that I'd much prefer to do this in person. Um, but yeah, it's not not possible at this point. I'm afraid. Uh, one last thing. Yeah, check out Tableau Public as well. The the um, the, the website. So if you go to discover on public.tableau.com. You can find Viz of the Day, which are you know, various dashboards um, for that people have been up uploading throughout the, the world recently. So there's some really cool stuff in here. Um, you can, for most of them, you can download them as well and open them up and reverse engineer them. Sometimes they do turn off that functionality, but let's take take this book a prize one. Hoping, yeah, this person has allowed me to download the Tableau workbook. I can click on that, download it, and then open it up in Tableau Desktop, and I can pull it apart. And I can see that. Here we go. We can see exactly how that person has built that particular chart. So it's a really good, um, really good learning resource. Sarika, I know, I know the data would be upside down, but this is more of a kind of illustration as to how framing can change perceptions. I mean, if, if that was genuinely going to be circulated, then obviously we'd, we'd change the data to make sure it was the right way up. But um, it was more a kind of visual thing, to be honest. Okay. Um, here we go. And, and that's it, really. So thank you for coming. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I, I think these are always more fun in person and we probably all had enough of Zoom, but unfortunately COVID's reared its ugly head again and here we are. But um, hopefully one day I get to meet you in person. Cool, thank you very much, Luke. That was um, very interesting. I, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm already starting to think of ways that I can use this and I'm looking forward to tomorrow's session um i'll put the link in the chat for tomorrow's session if ever anybody else wants to sign up to the the more advanced uh session um and um i'm putting you on the spot here luke but yeah in this later in the summer or start of next semester we can invite you over to another in-person session if you if you're up for it absolutely yeah yeah that'd be fun brilliant um, thank you there's a few, um, few different things that we could do yeah i don't know we've got time for a couple of questions if ever anybody's got any questions for luke no it doesn't seem like it um emma is putting some links in the chat as well um if you can fill out the feedback forms and just a big thank you again luke for your for your time and we'll see you again tomorrow no problem. Anna Rude, there was a question about what are the requirements. Um, there are no requirements in terms of people's backgrounds. Um, they, we, in terms of visas and things like that, um, unfortunately, we don't sponsor visas, uh, but we need to, um, whoever we employ has to have eligibility to work and live in the UK for 28 months. But that's that's about it, really. Other than that, numeracy um, and curiosity, analytical skills, that sort of thing. Cool. Thank you, everyone. We'll send around the recording and the slides.
um, after the session. Great. Thanks again, well, Luke. No problem. Thank you all, and maybe see you tomorrow.